Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to our webinar titled Pulse Wave Velocity, Theory, Applications, Methods, and Future Directions. Joining us today, we're fortunate to have Dr. Lee Stoner, an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and Gabriel Zeef, a doctoral candidate in Lee's lab. Their presentation will give us an in-depth overview of their research involving pulse wave velocity in a variety of different applications and a deep dive into the methods they use to record high quality and repeatable data. This webinar has been sponsored by AD Instruments, so a big thank you to them for helping to make this event possible. For over 30 years, AD Instruments has been creating simple, flexible tools to help scientists and educators record and analyze data quickly and efficiently. AD Instruments provides integrated solutions with the latest technology and powerful but simple tools that give you the ability to innovate and advance your research. Their gold standard solutions cover a variety of human, animal, in vitro, acute, and chronic applications, including pulse wave velocity. For more information about the tools that they offer, please see the resources tab for a link to their website. I'm Sarah McFarland from the events team here at Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. Now, before we get started, I would like to share just a few housekeeping notes to help you get the most out of today's webinar. First, this webinar is being recorded and resources will be made available following the event. Next, if the webinar panels look too big or too small, you can zoom in or out in your internet browser to adjust the viewing area. You can also resize some of these panels and make the media panel full screen. Please send questions, thoughts, and comments to us using the Ask a Question box next to the media panel at any time. You can also take a look at the resources panel where you'll find a few links and suggested readings associated with today's event. We will also be running a number of audience polls during the webinar and a survey at the end. So please chime in and share your perspectives with us. And finally, if you do happen to experience any technical issues during the event, the easy fix tends to be a simple refresh of the browser. This should reestablish your connection so you can hear us clearly. However, if this doesn't work and you continue to have issues, just use the ask a question box to communicate your issue with our team and we'll help to get you back up and running. Before we get started, we're just gonna run a quick audience set of polls. So um, the first question is, do you currently do research involving pulse wave velocity? Um, so the options are yes, no, no, but you plan to in the future and you don't do research. So I'll give everyone a couple seconds to answer that poll before we move on to the next one. Great, okay, thanks for participating in these polls. There are two more, so just be prepared. The next question is, which of the following models do you most often use? So there's mouse, rat, human, or other, um, or I don't do research. Sorry for the people who don't do research, you're gonna click that button one more time in the next poll. All right, and the last poll is, what amount of research are you performing compared to pre-pandemic levels? Um, so there's less than 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, and 75 to 100%. And that same option again, I don't do research. And I'll give everyone a couple more seconds to answer that. All right, uh, thanks so much for participating in those polls, everyone. Uh, we really appreciate that and your feedback. All right, and without further delay, I would like to officially welcome Gabriel and Lee. Um, guys, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Sarah, for the introduction. And thank you to everyone for joining Gabe and myself today. So in this talk, we're gonna cover the following topics. We'll start off by defining what we mean by pulse wave velocity. We'll then talk about the importance of this measurement different approaches we can take for measuring this construct. Um, then we'll look into, okay, we have these different approaches, but how do I select the right one? And finally, we will finish with some tips for making 
high quality measurements. So starting with what is pulse wave velocity, um, it's defined simply as the speed of uh, the forward traveling pressure wave between two sites. And the speed of this wave is um, thought to reflect arterial stiffness, which in turn is dependent on the structure and function of a vessel. Importantly, um, pulse wave velocity or arterial stiffness is not homogeneous along the arterial tree. So this cartoon um, depicts pulse wave velocity here. Uh, in particular, we are depicting carotid to femoral pulse wave velocity. So to make this measurement, we will measure the pulse wave at the carotid and femoral arteries. And then we will measure the pulse transit time, which is the time between the foot of the carotid wave to the foot of the femoral wave. And then we calculate the velocity as the distance between these sites divided by the um, pulse transit time. Okay, so next we are gonna look at the importance of this measure. So in this section, we will briefly touch on why this, why arterial stiffness is important. We'll then take a step back and um, look at the um, vascular system as, as a whole. And then we'll look at clinical significance. So why is it important? Well, arterial stiffness is a construct which is dependent on the functional and structural characteristics of a vessel. Structurally, it has been shown that acute changes in, in the filial function influence arterial stiffness. Structurally, arterial stiffness is dependent on the vessel wall matrix, including the composition of elastin and collagen. So let's take a step back for a moment and um, take an overview of the vascular system. If we look at a given blood vessel, we will see that it is composed of three layers. The innermost layer or the intima is where we find the endothelial cells. The medial layer, this is where we find the smooth muscle cells. And this layer um, con controls the tone of a, a, a blood vessel. The outer layer, the adventitial or external layer contains the connective tissue. And this layer is uh, important for maintaining the shape of the vessel. This is where we will also find the uh, innovation of nerves. Now, if we look at the arterial tree, these layers are present through, throughout the arterial tree and until we get down to the level of the capillaries. What does differ though, is the relative composition of each of those layers. Now, I showed you before the measurement of carotid to femoral pulse wave velocity. This measurement is of particular interest because it is thought to reflect the stiffness of the aorta. The aorta, which is a big tube coming off the left ventricle of the heart, is important because this artery presents the major opposition to the work of the heart. If we take a closer look at the composition of the aorta, we will see that the vessel contains thin walls relative to the diameter, uh, that these walls contain well-defined connective tissue, which contains many elastic fibers. And because of this, the vessel can act as a pressure reservoir. What we mean by this is when the blood is pumped out by the left ventricle, the, um, the vessel will expand. That mechanical energy from that expansion will be um, stored. And then subsequently, when it recoils, that recoil will help to push the blood flow forward. 
Now, coming back to arterial stiffness, I mentioned the aorta, but more generally speaking, why is arterial stiffness important? Well, if we take a closer look, we see that the vasculature gradually stiffens between the aorta and the peripheral blood vessels. This is important because this stiffness will help to ensure consistent blood flow, including during diastole. This will also help to attenu attenuate the forward traveling pressure wave, which we'll come back to, and it will moderate wave reflection, which are the waves that are reflected back towards the heart. Now, if arterial stiffness increases, particularly at that level of the aorta, this increase will adversely affect pulsatile hemodynamics. In particular, we will see an increase in pulsatile stress towards end organs, including um, the brain, and there will be greater arterial wave reflection with a resultant increase in myocardial load. So basically the heart will have to work harder to perform a given amount of work. Okay, let's finish this section by looking at clinical importance. This measure is important because um, it, it can um, predict disease early in, in the process. And, and by it, I'm referring mainly to carotid femoral pulse wave velocity here. It can predict future cardiovascular events. And we have some really great normative data available. This is a really nice cartoon, which was, was published a number of years ago, which simply depicts the process of atherosclerosis. Now, generally speaking, again, this is an oversimplification, but we begin with a dysfunction of the endothelium. So the functional characteristics of the vessel become impaired. This will start to lead to increased vascular stiffness, and then we'll start to see morphological changes. Now, those morphological changes uh, occur late in the process, but those stiffness changes still occur quite early. And those stiffness changes can predict future cardiovascular events in a range of patients. As I said, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity is the most widely used. This is widely considered the gold standard. And a meta-analysis by Vlachopoulos, um, I'm sorry if <laughs> I mispronounced that, um, found that for a one meter per second increase in pulse wave velocity, there's a 15% increased risk in cardiovascular disease. And we also have normative data available for adults, children, and FASC AgeNet is currently consolidating all of the literature. Um, so we have a full array of normative data. So recently, my colleagues and I conducted a review of longitudinal studies, which had incorporated carotid to femoral pulse wave velocity. And one of the reasons we did this is so that we could determine what the expected rate of change is um, with, with age. And we found that every five years, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity increases by between 0.2 to 0.7 meters a second. We followed this up by performing a systematic review and meta-regression of studies available in children. And in children, we found that pulse wave velocity increases by 0.12 meters per second per year. Here's an, another study that we did just to finish out this clinical significance section. We also looked at the contribution of endothelial function to pulse wave velocity. And we found that when we induced endothelial function acutely and, and acutely um, and locally, we did this in, in the arm, there was a corresponding um, increase in pulse wave velocity, so an increase in 
arterial stiffness. Okay, so we've established that pulse wave velocity is an important measure of arterial stiffness. So now let's go on to discuss some of the measurement approaches. So there are several ways to measure pulse wave velocity. These include tonometry, oscillometry, ultrasound, electrocardiogram, photoplethysmography, and transcranial Doppler, among others. Tonometry has been the most widely used method, and this method consists of applying a force over the center of a superficial artery against an underlying bone. So here we see the tonometer being placed on top of the skin and um, over that bone. Here are two example devices. On the left, we have the at core, sphygma core, and we see the tonometer or the pen-like device um, held in its um, probe holder there, sticking up. And on the right, we have the complier, and we see the tonometer held in place by a neck brace. With oscillometry, we use cuffs, or simply blood pressure cuffs, to detect the pressure waves. Here is, is an example set up for the Vicorder, which is an oscillometric device. Here we see another device by the ATCOR called the Excel, and this combines tonometry, or that pen-like pressure sensor, as well as the oscillometric component, which is the cuff, which is placed around the thigh. We can also use ultrasound to assess pulse wave velocity. Here we measure the velocity waveform at the proximal and then distal sites, and we can gate it to the ECG to determine the transit time. In this example, we were validating leg pulse wave velocity measurements. Although not as common, we have also been playing around with photoplethysmography, or for short, PPG. As shown on the image to the left, PPG contains infrared sensors which detect hemoglobin. On the top right, the red line that waveform depicts the raw PPG signal, and the black line, the second derivative, is used to identify the foot of the raw waveform. The bottom right shows a simultaneous ECG, or electrocardiogram, signal. We can then detect the speed at which the waveform travels from the heart to the PPG site. These are findings from a paper that's currently under review, in which we looked at photoplethysmography, or PPG, pulse wave velocity. Specifically, we looked at agreement between heart-toe pulse wave velocity via PPG against standard carotid ankle pulse wave velocity via the bicorder oscillometric system. We looked at overall agreement on the left, and, and as you can see, we found moderate agreement between these two devices. We also looked at repeated measures agreement following an orthostatic challenge and found strong agreement. It's also important to note that there are several places that we can start our path length from, the carotid, brachial, or ECG, as well as places which are, or can be, the distal sites of the pulse wave velocity segments. The most common pulse wave velocity measurement and the most clinically widely used is carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. However, we'd also like to highlight brachial femoral pulse wave velocity, as this seems to have some um, promise and may um, have some advantages over some of the limitations that carotid femoral pulse wave velocity has, such as the need to palpate at the carotid artery, which is a sensitive spot and which may be confounded by plaque. Here, we conducted brachial femoral pulse wave velocity on one-day-old babies. Very interestingly, we got awesome data, as you can see by these beautiful waveforms. We've also been experimenting with brain pulse wave velocity, which is an additional technique. Here we measure from the R wave on the ECG to the foot of the middle cerebral artery using our transcranial Doppler. This shows up our setup for data collection with our AD Instruments Power Lab device. Okay, so we discussed measurement approaches, but how do we select the correct tool? In selecting the proper tool, we should consider several factors. 
These include whether to prioritize internal versus external validity, what is our study design, and what population are we recruiting and wishing to generalize to. By internal validity, we mean the degree to which the change in the de dependent variable can be ascribed to the change in the independent variable. Or in other words, does A truly have an effect on B? By external validity, we are referring to the capacity for our results to translate to the outside world. In other words, do our results in the lab, are they meaningful when we leave the lab to the real world scenario? Here's a diagram depicting internal versus external validity. External validity is shown on the left. This is how we sample. Internal validity is on the right. This is our study design. As this schematic shows, internal validity and external validity are always going to have a bit of a tug of war. As we prioritize one, the other will inherently be less prioritized. So this is something we should always um, be needing to consider and our study design and research question should determine um, which type of validity we want to prioritize most highly. As an example of this, the Journal of Applied Physiology recently had a point counterpoint series on whether investigators interested in vascular physiology should control for the menstrual cycle. Myself and another PhD student contributed to this point counterpoint series and brought up the issues that I'm bringing up here. That study design and research question should ultimately dictate how and how and why we should prioritize internal versus external validity. There are a number of threats to internal validity, including the following. Now, let's focus a little bit more on instrumentation. We want a device which is accurate, but also precise. This is an ideal world. If we need to pick one, we will prioritize accuracy. As an example of a measurement consideration and um, our desire to prioritize accuracy, our lab often investigates the effects of sedentary behavior exposure on the cardiovascular system. But how do we measure arterial stiffness or pulse wave velocity in the sitting position or in response to an acute bout of sedentary behavior? If we measure while, se while seated, there is some orthostasis occurring, which is leading to additional potentially confounding physiological effects. So are we truly still examining arterial stiffness? Likely not. This is just a simple example showing some of these confounding measurement issues that we face with the pulse wave velocity measure. To summarize the importance of internal validity, Again, if we don't know the effect of A is really making a difference on our outcome B, we really don't have results that we can be confident in. As we can see here, crap in equals crap out. With human participants, there are also ethical and moral considerations which we need to take into account as we prioritize um, internal validity. Next, we question the selection of the appropriate tool for a given study design. There are many types of designs, observational, parallel, randomized cross crossover trial, and quasi-experimental, among others. When thinking about the design, the appropriate tool selection we need is something we need to consider. The research question is the most important consideration. We just discussed that pulse wave velocity measurements in a seated posture may not capture exactly what we want to be looking for, which is arterial stiffness. So if we capture while seated, are we really considering our research question? Lastly, let's briefly discuss the appropriate tool selection for special populations, depending on who we are going to recruit. Some examples of special populations include women, particularly pregnant women, certain chronic disease populations, such as obesity, spinal cord injury, 
cancer, populations where ambulation is impaired, and others. Taking pregnancy as an example, one of the major sources of error for pulse wave velocity is typically path length, as this is one of the primary variables that we're using to calculate pulse wave velocity. This is problematic with pregnant women as depicted in the illustration. Options include adapting a board compass or using a segmo segmometer or anthropometer. The important thing is to try and avoid body contours and get as direct a linear path as possible. Another problematic population is stroke. Most strokes are caused by plaque building up in a carotid artery, followed by thrombosis or clotting. So which artery do we measure, the affected or the non-affected artery? Is this plaque buildup affecting our pulse wave velocity? Likely it is. Or should we alternatively use a different approach with stroke patients? Here, we compared carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, which as you can recall, is the most commonly reported pulse wave velocity measure. And we're comparing this with heart femoral pulse wave velocity. We found strong agreement. And as you may um, be able to consider, heart femoral pulse wave velocity eliminates that potentially confounding carotid segment in patients like stroke patients who may have plaque buildup. Let's finish this webinar by covering some tips for ensuring we can make high quality measurements. These tips are going to be um, broken down in terms of theoretical, practical and device based tips. So some theoretical tips, as Gabe mentioned just now, we should always start with a really clear research question. This will help us to identify the appropriate tool. And then with respect to that question and the given study design, which factors may confound the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable? My recommendation is to always plot out a conceptual model or DAG, as these issues tend to clarify as we conceptualize the problem. What about some practical considerations? Well, I think that we should have a clear data collection sheet to start. A data collection sheet should be like a good recipe. Um, hence my a uh, picture of Fug Kitchen to the right, which is my favorite cookbook. Uh, I don't cook, but um, I like the cookbook. Um, you should know your anatomy and you should know how to detect what is a high quality waveform. So with respect to uh, anatomy, here's that example we showed earlier of the carotid artery being a planted we should understand what we're actually looking for and know what to do with that artery, i.e. why we're compressing it and where we're compressing it to ensure that we can get a high quality reading. To ensure that we are taking high quality measurements, we also need to make sure we can understand what is a good waveform or not um, in real time. So we want to look for adequate signal strength. We want to make sure that the waveform has a clear upstroke. And if the particular device does it, make sure that it is identifying the um, correct foot on the waveform. OK, so let's finish with some device based considerations. My recommendation. Well, I mean, the obvious one is that we practice, practice, practice. As we discussed before, you should know your device assumptions. You should understand what you're measuring um, and that there should be training. By training, I mean, you should first establish within day reliability. I, I recommend testing um, 10 people and within a given day, assessing them 
three times, an acceptable ICC would be 0.9. We should then do the same with between day reliability. I mean, assessing 10 people over three separate days. And then if there's going to be more than one observer for a, a given study, um, which is not recommended, but we can't always escape that, we should then determine whether there's between observer reliability. There should also be ongoing quality control. My recommendation is that someone with established expertise reviews the first four records and gives them a quality score and some feedback. And for a given study, these records aren't included in the study if the quality is subpar. And then ongoing, it is recommended that a random sample of 20 records per month um, is inspected and that retraining is provided if more than two records have low quality. So just to summarize this section, I gave some theoretical recommendations, including making sure we have a sound research question and that we understand potential confounders in our model. Some practical considerations, including making sure you have a good data sheet that acts as a recipe, know your anatomy, know how to ascertain whether the waveform is of suitable quality. And then there are device-based um, um, factors. Gabe mentioned path length earlier on, but we should also know what the device assumptions are, and we should ensure that there is adequate training before a given study commences. Well, hopefully we learned what is pulse wave velocity, an important measure of arterial stiffness. Why is it important? What are the measurement approaches, as well as the selection considerations in terms of what tool we want to measure pulse wave velocity with? And we also covered tips for obtaining high quality measurements. We thank you very much for listening and we welcome any and all questions. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thanks so much, guys, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A, uh, we are going to run a couple audience polls here. So the first question is, uh, were you aware of 80 instruments and their solutions before this webinar? Uh, yes or no? And I'll give you guys a couple seconds to answer that question. And while you are answering, I did want to bring your attention um, to a survey. So at the end of the webinar today, there you will be uh, forwarded to a survey. We'd love to get your feedback. Uh, it's really important um, for us to, to get this information and, and we really appreciate any um, feedback that you have on the event and um, the technical quality of the event today. So that survey is right here. So please, um, if you can take a couple of minutes to fill that out, that'd be really appreciated. Okay, and we're going to move to our next poll, which is, uh, would you like 80 Instruments to contact you with additional resources on pulse wave velocity research? Um, so this is anywhere from products to uh, resources that they have on uh, the use of products and um, the solutions that they offer. So uh, we really appreciate that feedback from you all as well. And uh, while you guys are answering that, I'm going to welcome uh, Lee and Gabe back to the floor here. Hey guys, are you with us? Yep, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Great. Okay, so um, let's kick off this Q&A with our first question. Um, so Lee, this question is for you. Um, this person has asked, if I'm getting started with pulse wave velocity, is there a particular device that you would recommend? Um, yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, there are a lot of devices available on the market. The um, One of the devices that Gabe showed earlier, the, the Sphigma Core, the AtCore, the AtCore Excel is um, you know, highly recommended because AtCore is probably the leader in, in, in the field and highly trusted um, for the quality of their assessments. It, it, it is partly tonometry based. So um, some 
degree of training is required. A another good recommendation, I really like the um, Vicorder, which is completely oscillometric and requires a low degree of training. Great, thanks for that. Um, so the next question here is actually for you, Gabe. Um, this question is, you showed that pulse wave velocity changed following an orthostatic challenge. Does this mean that blood pressure needs to be taken into account when measuring pulse wave velocity? Yes, that's a great observation. Um, we do know that blood pressure does impact pulse wave velocity. So um, with that being the case, we do typically recommend that um, we include a MAP or mean arterial pressure as um, a covariate um, when we are doing our analysis. Um, we also want to be mindful of any medications that could alter blood pressure, uh, as well as um, body position, um, which could also um, impact blood pressure, as, as we saw with um, the example of sitting. Um, so yeah, great question. Great. Thanks for that. Um, we've got another question here. This is not addressed to anyone in particular, so you can both take a stab at it if you'd like. Um, this question is, what is the clinical implication of stiffness in small arteries like microvasculature when compared to stiffness in large arteries like the aorta? Yeah. Um, I mean, we don't typically look at the small arteries. There, there are... Um, devices that we can estimate them um, or estimate, you know, um, small artery stiffness, such as wave intensity analysis, which, you know, more complicated technique. But of course, you know, those small resistance vessels, or the small arterioles, particularly the resistance vessels are going to regulate blood pressure. So one of the obvious clinical ramifications is um, an increase in blood pressure. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Um, okay, so the next question here is, what is the gold standard of assessing pulse wave velocity among those available devices that you mentioned? For example, ultrasound, tonometry, or MRI? Yeah, um, the, so, <clears throat> oh yeah, go on, go on Gabe, you can take it. Okay, yeah, I was just gonna mention, as Lee highlighted the, um, the Sphygma core um, XL is typically considered um, and, and its use with um, carotid femoral pulse wave velocity is um, typically considered um, that gold standard um, device and um, measurement path. Um, and I think it's, it's a kind of a burgeoning field, our investigation into other path lengths and, and other devices <laughs> as we kind of allude, alluded to in the presentation um, in terms of trying to figure out some, some novel strategies to get, a, get around some of the limitations that this current gold standard does present. Great. Um, this is a theoretical kind of physiology-based question. Um, why does the pulse wave velocity increase when vessel stiffness increases? Um, <clears throat> so if you, you, um, the, you think about a vessel, normally it's got all the, um, um, elastic fibers in it that's making it compliant. And as a pressure wave travels through it, that elasticity will slow down the pressure wave. Conversely, now imagine that the artery is a solid tube like a, a pipe, um, there's going to be you know, no resistance to that pressure wave and it's just, just going to shoot straight through it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, the next question here is, could there be a difference in the pulse wave velocity measured with PPG due to the measurement of volume change rather than the pressure change? Um, 
Sarah, I think you you cut out there for a second. Can you repeat that question, please? Yep. Um, could there be a difference in the pulse wave velocity measured <clears throat> with PPG due to the measurement of volume change rather than pressure change? He, yes, that's that's a good point. Um, the so we actually don't didn't expect the PPG based. Um, system to to give us ex exactly um, the same um, uh, kind of value, or rather, it's the the PPG system is going to result in a slightly different um, measurement because it's going to be on a different scale. So partially because of the reason that you mentioned, um, or the the person asking the the question mentioned, given that um, it is related to these small um volume changes rather than pressure per se and also because um the path lengths are not exactly the same um in terms of the um the criterion that we were comparing against so yes um the value as we expect will be slightly different but um the agreement was still um moderate to strong in terms of um the way in which the measurement um, um, responded to that orthostatic orthostatic challenge. Right. And Gabe, you should also point out there that the, the measurement is different. I mean, it's faster um, with the PPG because we, we, we're measuring from ECG and we're taking the R wave, which is not um, the start of the um, ventricular pressure wave. So, um, <clears throat> And there's, there's no easy way of um, making adjustments for that. Um, so that is gonna give us a slightly different measurement as well. Right, okay, because that PPG measurement is normalized to the R peak in the, in the ECG. Yeah, we're going from the R peak to the foot of the flow wave rather than from a foot of a flow wave to a foot of a flow wave. So right. um, there's, you know, there's an extra source of variability in there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Cool. Okay. Um, we have another question here. We've got tons of questions. Keep them coming, guys. Um, they're fantastic. So this person has asked, what effect does acute and chronic exercise have on pulse wave velocity? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, so... The, one of the major reasons that we are interested in pulse wave velocity is that we use it as kind of a biomarker of vascular aging. So with age, it does increase naturally. That is expected. And that's what you know we showed from our previous review. And we see this in children and in adults. Now, there isn't like a, a natural physiological rate of aging, but that rate of aging um increases through exposure to adverse environmental factors you know if people eat poor diets they don't get enough physical activity etc the the slope of that increase over time gets faster so folks get a greater increase in pulse wave velocity um, per year um, with exercise it's going to maintain the health of the the blood vessel and one of the primary ways that it does this is is direct um, exercise creates great hemodynamic stresses on the on the blood vessel um, particularly in shear stress and hopefully laminar shear stress on the on the blood vessel and this is the stimulus that the blood vessel needs to um, maintain and in, improve its health so over time you, you can decrease pulse wave velocity with chronic exercise. Um, acutely, it depends where in the body you are looking at. So in the aorta, it's, it's gonna go down straight after exercise because you know, you've just whooshed all of that blood through the aorta. And with that, you know, shear stress increases, endothelial function improves. And as a result, stiffness goes down in the legs though um because there's a lot more blood going down there and we want to get it back towards the heart you may actually see 
an increase in stiffness due to input from the autonomic nervous system. Um, that is, unless people have some kind of chronic um, condition that's affecting their autonomic system. So, for example, in stroke patients, after exercise, the stiffness goes down and stays down, which is a bad thing because it's enabling all the blood to pull in the legs and not get back to the heart and therefore not get back to the brain. Okay. Yeah, so you kind of want a little bit of stiffness. I would, just, I would just add it. Can I just add one more thing on top of that, Sarah? Yeah, of course. I, yeah, I would just add that I think the, the acute exercise scenario is a great um, example of a situation in which we really want to consider, um, you know, when and how we would want to uh, measure um, pulse wave velocity. If we're still in such an acute um, post-exercise phase that, um, you know, we still have, um, you know, a lot of sympathetic nervous system activation and, you know, we're still riding an elevated blood pressure, well, that's going to affect our um, arterial stiffness measure. So, you know, thinking about okay, we do want to look at the acute effects of exercise, but how how soon after that exercise bout do we want to measure stiffness? So just another good example of those methodological considerations and study design mm -hmm. considerations. Yeah, and related to that point, Gabe, you, we would include mean arterial pressure as a time variant, covariate, because we want to see change in stiffness, not change in blood pressure. So we're going to need to factor out the blood pressure component. Right. Lots of things to consider. Um, and thanks so much for all of your uh, insights on that. I know people um, have lots of questions for you guys and they're looking to you guys as the pros. So it's really great. Um, we've got another question here. This question is, uh, which position could be the ideal position to measure pulse wave velocity in pregnant women? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That one's a trickier one, and we are doing um, pregnancy studies at the moment. And part of this is going to be dependent on the device that you use, because ideally you'd have them laying on their side. Because, you know, if you think about pregnancy and all that weight um, around their stomach, it's going to push down on the aorta, not to mention, you know, collapse the vein. Um, but that's going to influence your measurement. Um, so you can do that with the sphygma core, um, which is what we're using for a, a study right now. Um, if you're using the, like, the vicorder, um, with the vicorder, because you're using osculometry around the neck, um, so there's like a, that sounds bad, but just there's a little balloon going around the neck to pick up the pulse but it's being influenced by the vein and you can get venous backflow. So you need to slightly tilt the body forward and you can't do that if someone is laying down on, on their side. Okay. So something to think about for pregnancy studies. Awesome. Okay. Um, we have another question here. This question is, does the obesity paradox have an impact on pulse wave velocity? um yes it does and um we see uh, sorry gabe i'm answering here because this is part of the <clears throat> reviews that um uh michelle anna and i have done um with cross-sectional studies we see a decrease with the rate of obesity but that's cross-sectionally um but we don't see the same longitudinally longitudinally pulse wave velocity will go down as expected. So um, those kind of conflicting foundings for the cross-sectional studies may be explained by a number of factors. Um, one may be, you know, we're just not able to get as good measurements on the um, uh, obese folks, um, particularly you're doing tonometry and, and and it's tough to, to plant the vessel well, but also there's changes in the hemodynamics, including an elevated heart rate, which may confound the measurement that we get in, as well as some blood volume shifts. 
Um, yeah, so that is an area that definitely warrants more attention and not fully understood, but some potential explanations that you know we should explore further. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we've got another question here about different populations, so I'll ask that one now. Um, does altitude or ethnicity have effects on pulse wave velocity? Hmm. <laughs> That, that's a good question. I haven't um, I haven't done um, much work in, in the area of altitude. However, in terms of um, ethnicity, we do know there's um, we see the same um, kind of pattern of um, disparity in terms of um, you know white versus black or white versus um, non-white populations that we see. Um, in other health outcomes like or other health indices like blood pressure or um, diabetes. So we, we do know that there's, you know, an elevation in, in um, some of these stiffness measures um, in uh, minority populations, um, which, as we can might imagine, um, may not be um, um, due to um, innate physiological um, differences per se between race, but could also be very much impacted by, um, you know, um, um, socio-cultural factors that um, are impacting um, health determinants, behavioral determinants, um, et cetera. Yeah, and, okay. and we should say not, you know, we, we can't lump all minorities there. So for instance, we know African-Americans have uh, much greater risk of cardiovascular disease than do their white counterparts. So we would expect higher pulse wave velocity. And a, a colleague of mine, Michelle Meyer, is just adding pulse wave velocity to the Jackson Heart Study. So in you know, sometime in the next couple of years, there'll be some useful data. But now if we look at um, Latinos, is the a paradox. So they have many risk factors, but not as high rates of the cardiovascular disease and that's not fully understood. So my, my same colleague, Michelle Meyer, is adding um, uh, to um, pulse wave velocity measurements to HR as well, like the, the Hispanic longitudinal studies so to, to track that over time in that population as well. Cool, that's gonna be some awesome data, I think. All right, uh, we've got a ton more questions here. Uh, we've only got eight minutes left. So um, before I move on, I do want to mention that uh, a recording of today's event will be made available. Um, you'll get an email about it. If you do have any more questions, submit them now using the Q&A panel. Um, our lovely speakers will be answering all of your questions in a document, um, and that Q&A report will be um, promoted on our website and you'll get an email about it as well. So um, keep uh, your eyes open for that in a couple weeks. Um, Gabe and Lee, you have your work cut out for you because we've got like over a hundred questions here. So um, it'll be really <laughs> awesome. Um, but I do want to move on to some more questions. So if you have time to stick around, that's great. If not, and you have to go, that's okay. You can watch the Q&A portion of this. Um, and also, uh, please take time to fill out that survey before you go. Um, that's really appreciated. All righty. Um, so our next question here is, um, is there any relationship between local pulse wave velocity and the gold standard of carotid femoral pulse wave velocity? So I'm assuming this means like local to like mm -hmm. an organ, for example, um, if you wanted to do main like trunk aorta to like, for example, a renal artery or something like that. Um, I'll let Gabe um, comment on this because he's done a bunch of, had a paper um, last year on local pulse wave um, velocity estimates. Yeah, so um, the local estimates, um, they are related to the segmental um, the segmental pulse wave velocity, but uh, as as the name um, describes, they are estimates. In other words, we're not actually measuring a velocity because we're not looking at uh, distance and time per se. Uh, 
um, we're looking at um, changes in pressure relative to changes in diameter. Um, so we um, found that similar to um, segmental pulse wave velocity, um, local estimations of pulse wave velocity um, are also pressure dependent. Um, and, and there is work, um, albeit less work than um, two point or segmental pulse wave velocity, but there is work um, showing that, that um, these local estimates do have some uh, clinical implications um, similar to um, two point pulse wave velocity as well. So there, there is this um, some capacity for, for clinical, um, clinical use and meaning um, but more work does need to be done in this area. Yeah, I mean, of, of these, the like clinically, the carotid is most useful and is, a, is very highly related to stroke risk. Okay, great. Um, so awesome. And we've got another question here about pulse wave velocity in the brain. So um, this person has said, I was interested in the cerebral pulse wave velocity measurements that you mentioned during the presentation. Is this done just using ECG and transcranial Doppler or are there other methods that are used? Um, not like right now, and there's very little that's been done with um, TCD. The, the only other stuff that I know of is by a, I think it's a Japanese guy who's done a couple of papers on it. But I, I guess like technically it's possible for MRI, um, but I, I haven't seen any. This is, this is an area that definitely warrants um, further attention, not, not least because these um, pulsatile hemodynamics are uh, related to brain health, like in, in, including Alzheimer's, um, you know, we know um, uh, other measures of stiffness around the body, not like ones directly in the brain though, are associated with um, brain health. So it is, a, it is a really exciting area. And my, my colleagues and I actually have a, a special on this topic in um, Frontiers in Cardiovascular Medicine at the moment, looking at hemodynamics and brain health. So we're, we're asking for submissions to the special right now. So as a plug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Awesome. Yeah. Um, if you do want to reach out to Lee about that, um, his email is on the screen there. Um, so yeah, be sure to send any requests his way. Uh, we've got, I think we have time for at least one more question. So I'm going to keep going if you guys have time. Um, do you need to replicate measurements of the distance length to determine variability? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think as Gay pointed out, it's normally the major source of error for these measurements. The most important um, recommendation is not to use a tape measure um, because, you know, it's going to be influenced by body contours. You need something that's going to overcome that. Um, so what what we would normally do is make sure that very precisely we've identified the spots that we're detecting the pulse at, and then we've adapted one of those board compasses that gave showed and we'll look at the, the measurement and then we take it across to a, a height meter on the wall to look at the distance and then we'll repeat it and if the next one is the same then we'll we'll keep it if not we'll um, measure again but those measurements will also be recorded so that if we have a repeat visit um, that we'll, we'll put it in exactly the same spot next time so we'll use those measurements and we'll take pictures as well just to make sure we can replicate Okay, awesome. That's a good tip. All right. Um, oh, there's so many questions here. Uh, this is really awesome, guys. Um, because we only have a minute left, I think that's going to be our last question. Um, but before you go, I did just want to bring your attention one more time to that survey. And also, you can click through the resources tab um, in the auditorium here 
to take a look at the um, cardiometabolic lab at UNC, um, Lee's lab, and the same lab that Gabe is in, and um, take a look at their research gate as well. They have some really awesome papers there. Um, and lastly, I did want to bring your attention to our next cardiovascular related webinar that's also sponsored by AD Instruments. Um, this is going to be a webinar about using ECG collection in zebrafish. So very, very cool work done um, in LA by Dr. Tao Wen. Um, and so that will be in May. So if you are interested in registering for that, click that info button on your slides now, and you'll be taken to that landing page on our website where you can register and learn more. Um, so I did want to thank Lee and Gabe. Thank you both so much for your fantastic presentation, your insights during the Q&A. You've got your work cut out for you on this Q&A report. I'm not joking. There are over 112 <laughs> questions. So that's really awesome. All righty. Um, and yeah, lastly, yeah, um, oh, no, no problem. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And I also wanted to send another thank you again to AD Instruments for sponsoring and making this event possible. Um, and also providing really awesome instrumentation for research. Um, and lastly, I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, thanks for taking time out of your day to join us. As I mentioned before, a recording will be made available. So keep your eyes open for an email when it's ready. Um, and you can log in and check that out. And uh, we hope to have you with us again soon. Thanks so much.